Okay. So um, just to start off again, for those who have just joined us, again, my name is Jessica Mahoney. I am a partner at J&G Law. Uh, I focus in the area of real estate, um, mostly residential. So uh, this is our introduction here. This is what we're gonna talk about. And we're gonna get started. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is making a uh, purchase offer. So this is something that unless you are experienced in real estate, uh, in the real estate world, uh, making an offer can be extremely intimidating. And I say that both um, as an attorney who has worked with many first-time home buyers, uh, but also as a person who has purchased a home as well uh, in New York and other states, making that initial offer is scary uh, because there's a lot that goes into it. And it's really important to understand what those components are um, to fully digest those components. So that way you, as the purchaser, feel comfortable in making that offer. Uh, this really does set the tone for your whole transaction. And it can be really, really hard uh, to, to, full, to change this as you start to move into contract terms, which we'll talk about in a moment, because a lot of the stuff really comes from this main purchase offer. So it is super important for our buyers to understand what are you writing in this offer that a seller is considering and accepting on, on your behalf. So um, really breaking this down is something that if you are a first time home buyer can be super duper helpful um, just to really understand what you're agreeing to and, uh, and how that will set the tone as you go on. Um, so the first major thing, um, you know, of course you're gonna set forth a purchase price, right? What is your offer price? What are you willing to pay for this property? That's so subjective to every transaction and something that, that most buyers will be working with a qualified and professional real estate agent to help decide what amount of money makes sense in that situation. Uh, for us, I'd like to talk about contingencies as being an important uh, first step because although you'll set forth a price in your offer, um, contingencies are certainly something that sellers do look at. Um, that are really important to sellers when they're comparing various offers, but they're also really something that a buyer needs to be aware of because trying to add in contingencies after the fact um, can oftentimes be met with uh, not a favorable response from the seller. So the first one being a home inspection. So a home inspection is going to be super common, especially in the state of New York. We're considered to be a buyer beware state. Uh, what that means is that you as the buyer are required to do certain due diligence inspections and feel comfortable with those inspections before you proceed um, in actually completing your purchase of the home. In other states, you might do inspections after you actually go into contract. While in New York State, um, that's a little bit different. So in New York State, uh, at least in the Hudson Valley area, which is where we practice, uh, it's commonplace for us to actually uh, have the inspections completed before a formal contract is signed. So when the market is really high um, and the sellers are receiving lots of offers, a lot of things but a lot of times buyers consider, what can I waive in my offer to make this more attractive to the seller? And I'll tell you that, that most of the time um, I have buyers that come in that waive inspections because they're either contractors or um, they are, are experienced buyers who can walk through the house. They know what they're looking for and they feel confident that waiving an inspection makes sense for them. To a seller, that can be very, very attractive, right? So you don't have a buyer coming in saying, I want, the, I want you to complete 10 repairs for me before I buy this house. Um, so it's definitely something that is really uh, attractive to a seller that may be why a seller chooses this offer over another one. So for a buyer, I would want buyers to really understand what waiving an inspection actually means. So part of it does mean waiving the right to have, um, you know, a qualified professional come in and assess the condition of this property and give you a report based on the condition. So there are plenty of buyers out there that, that certainly feel comfortable walking in the door, waiving that home inspection, because they feel like if they do so, um, that they're, they'll get their offer accepted and that they have the qualifications needed to walk through the house and know what has to be done. Um, so they feel comfortable doing that. The legal side of that is that you buy the house in, in what we call as is condition. So as is, uh, of course, means that it's the way you see it is the way that you're going to take it at the closing. And a lot of buyers do understand that. 
Um, however, what they don't quite understand always is that when we do get to the point of closing, you have an opportunity to complete a final walkthrough. And what that walkthrough is there for is not for you to go through the house and do a complete inspection of the property um, like you would maybe in the beginning of the transaction, but to make sure that that property is in the same as is condition uh, that you believed um, it was at the time you entered into the contract. So, you know, a lot of things, of course, can change during the transaction. The seller may have moved out. Um, maybe there has been, you know, water damage, a pipe burst, something like that. Uh, so that final walkthrough is super important for the buyer because you want to be able to see what that property looks like before you actually become the owner. Make sure it is in that same as-is condition. However, if there is a change in the condition, um, it can be difficult for us as the buyer's uh, attorney to prove that the property actually has changed over the time of the contract. So in other words, it's as is, as of the time you enter into the contract. So if you do walk into the property during that final walkthrough and find out that the HVAC system is not working at all, um, the seller may say, yeah, you know, it actually hasn't been working for a couple of years. That's why we're selling it in this as is condition. Uh, and our proof really doesn't exist, right? We don't have a written document telling us that um, the inspection, uh, you know, noted that the system was in working order or even good working order. So it can be a little bit difficult for us at the end at closing to try and negotiate um, any type of credit or adjournment of the closing based on that change of condition. So I do caution buyers, especially first time home buyers, um, against waiving an inspection uh, for those reasons. If you are in a situation where you feel like you are comfortable waiving the inspection because you're not going to ask for repairs from the seller, then maybe you consider putting in a contingency where it's a home inspection um, but not, not necessarily to ask for repairs, not to ask the seller to do anything to the property, but just so that you can get an idea of whether this property is in fact decent condition enough for you to purchase, um, and also to have that written document to use when you do your final walkthrough of the property. Another contingency, very, very common that we see will be a mortgage contingency. So if you are planning to finance your purchase uh, with a mortgage, then you will likely make your offer contingent upon the, the receipt of that of mortgage approval. Um, so you may have received a pre-approval and very commonly you will receive a pre-approval in order to start making offers on properties because sellers do want to make sure before they even consider your offer that you can stand by what you are offering and that may be a large financing component. So a mortgage contingency is super common, um, but we want to make sure that it's clear on what, what that is contingent upon. So what is your mortgage amount, right? Because we don't want to change that on a seller as we get into contract. Are you looking to put down 20% and finance 80%? Because if you are, you also need to make sure that you're willing to and have the ability to put down the additional money that is needed for the closing costs on the property. Um, so it is important uh, to make sure that you have an idea of the total cost of this transaction, even before you make that offer. So that way, you know that your mortgage amount that you're, you are putting forth on that purchase offer is in fact accurate. You also want to specify there the type of financing that you're looking to obtain. So if you're looking to get a conventional loan, that may be treated much differently um, from a seller standpoint than somebody who's looking to receive an FHA or a VA loan. Those loans uh, are government insured loans, which can oftentimes take a little bit longer and can also require certain repairs to the property, depending on any safety concerns noted during the appraisal. So it is very important to be clear, am I seeking this VA loan? Am I seeking an FHA loan or even a USDA loan, which are very specific loan types that may require other things outside of what a conventional loan would require. So it is important to work with your lender ahead of making that purchase offer to make sure you know what type of loan you are applying for and what you want to make this contingent upon. Falling under that same category is an appraisal contingency. 
So an appraisal contingency um, refers to what the bank or what your lender is valuing the property that you are purchasing. Um, and so you have set forth a number, right? That's your offered price, your purchase price. And you're saying, I believe that this property is worth X amount of dollars and I'm willing to pay that to the seller for this property. However, that number, that purchase price may differ from actually the number that the bank has valued the property at. And that's through an independent appraiser. The independent appraiser will use other sources for example, comparative sales um, to decide whether the value actually matches what you are looking to pay for the property. There are some buyers out there that are willing to waive an appraisal contingency because they are willing to bring additional funds to closing to make up a gap. And I'll get into that in a moment. But it is important to understand that the appraisal is a really big part of your mortgage financing, because if the property does not appraise for the purchase price that you're offering, um, you could be in a situation where you're not going to qualify for your loan. And then as a result, you want to make sure your down payment is protected. Uh, going back a little bit uh, towards waiving the appraisal. So even if you are obtaining a mortgage on the property, you actually can waive the appraisal on the property. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you purchase the property, let's say you set forth a price of $300,000 um, and the bank has decided that this property is only worth $280,000 through their valuation from that, that independent appraiser, then that means that your loan, if you were to finance 80%, would only be 80% of the $280,000 appraised value. It's not 80% of the $300,000 value. So in that case, you'd still be required, if you waived your appraisal, you would still be required to purchase the property at the $300,000 number. And you would have to bring additional cash to closing to make up that gap. So this is really something that we've seen as being common over the last few years and actually still see, I'm still seeing this now, um, that there are buyers out there that are willing to take the risk and waive these appraisals because again, it is something that is very attractive to a seller in getting their offer accepted. It's just really important to understand the risk involved. Um, what I generally uh, talk to buyers about is setting some type of a floor that you are willing to pay um, and make up that gap, but that if it were more than that gap, you would not be. So let's, for example, back to our $300,000 purchase price. Let's say that you're willing to make up a gap of $10,000. In that case, you're willing to proceed at a purchase price of $300,000 as long as the property appraises for at least $290,000. Okay, so that number there um, means that if it appraised for $290,000, you would be bringing essentially 10 additional thousand dollars to closing. So something to make sure that you do feel comfortable with well ahead of submitting that offer because you don't want to backtrack on waiving the appraisal um, as you go into contract. So setting a floor helps give you a comfort level of where you should be in the worst case scenario. So if the property back to our situation were to appraise for 280,000, now you do have the right to cancel because it is below the price that you set that floor of 290,000. So then you would have the right to cancel and have your down payment refunded. Um, attorney review is, is going to be something that I would say is pretty standard in a purchase offer. So this is something that if you are a buyer from out of state and you are more experienced in another state's practice for submitting an offer, uh, you might actually um, not understand what this means. But really, it's that the purchase offer is not your binding contract end all be all for the most part. If it's subject to attorney review, it means that you and the seller are both obtaining separate legal counsel to work through the terms that are set 
forth on the purchase offer and many additional terms that are going to go into the main contract, which we will talk about momentarily. Um, so the attorney review is not any type of specified period of time like it might be in other states, but instead it's kind of this general term that means that neither party is specifically bound to this purchase offer until a formal contract of sale is signed. If you are a buyer and, and you are submitting an offer, I would absolutely make sure that this attorney review language is in there regardless of whether you are willing to waive a home inspection, mortgage contingency, or appraisal contingency, attorney review is one of the necessary items that have to be in that purchase offer. Another necessary item would be following right below that, and that would be clear title. So clear title um, can be something that is difficult to understand, but that's why you have an attorney representing you in the transaction. Um, you, a title search, which we will talk about in more detail as we move on with this presentation, but the title search will take place during the contract timeframe. So having clear title to the property um, is an important item for completing this purchase. So it is definitely necessary for this to be in your purchase offer. And below that, there could be other contingencies. Uh, for example, would be a home sale contingency. Uh, so if you are a seller and a purchaser at the same time, regardless of whether that sale is taking place in the state of New York or elsewhere, um, if your obligations in purchasing a property are conditioned upon the sale successfully being completed, you absolutely should put in a home sale contingency. The risk factor here is that if you don't put that contingency in and your sale falls through for any reason, you may forfeit your down payment to the seller. Um, so if you are willing to take that risk, and some buyers may be in a specific situation willing to, to take on that additional risk, then that's fine. But otherwise, if you do have obligations that are conditioned on a sale of another home or another property, is very important to make your offer contingent so that way your down payment is protected in that situation. Moving on to a down payment, um, this is something that will definitely be specified on the purchase offer form that you sign. So the down payment, um, actually that term can be very loosely referred to two different items. So there's a contract down payment, but there's also a mortgage down payment. So the contract down payment is referring to what you as the buyer are willing to put into the seller's attorney's escrow account to secure your obligations under the contracts of sale. Uh, if you default, then you may forfeit that money that is being held in the seller's attorney's escrow. Um, so this can be different actually from a mortgage down payment. And a lot of times it should be a different number. So back to our example of a $300,000 purchase price, if you are financing 80%, that means that you are putting down a $60,000 mortgage down payment. You are bringing $60,000 to the table and you are financing $240,000. Putting $60,000 down on the signing of a contract is a very big number because if you were to default, even if it was unintentional, you could forfeit the $60,000. Now to a seller, a seller wants to see a large down payment. Why? Because they know that you have more to lose than maybe a buyer that put down only $5,000 on their purchase offer. They feel more comfortable choosing oftentimes an offer that has that higher contract down payment. Um, in this situation where your mortgage down payment is $60,000, maybe you consider putting down $20,000, $15,000, maybe $30,000, right? So there are different numbers there that still are strong numbers, right? Still a good amount of money for the seller to feel comfortable with, but it wouldn't be your entire down payment if things went south. Even though that's a really rare situation where a buyer does lose a down payment, it is something that as a buyer, and especially as a first time home buyer, having never done this before, to understand the risk involved um, in entering that contract really is that number that you're putting in escrow. 
So I would really um, caution buyers towards those considerations. And if there are any questions, then that would be a great reason to contact your attorney. Um, even though you may only be at the stage of a purchase offer, you may want to find out, well, wait a minute, if my mortgage down payment is $60,000, I really don't want to put down $60,000 in the signing of a contract. Let me talk to my attorney about what the risk level is and what their opinion might be based on the specific situation. The next item is financing versus cash. So we already talked about the mortgage contingency and what that looks like um, and how to choose a type of financing and really that all of that should be settled before you actually submit any type of purchase offer. Um, but you may be questioning why, uh, you know, cash offers, of course, um, may be more uh, interesting, more beneficial to a seller. And the reason behind that really is the time frame. So the time frame for closing is oftentimes also set forth roughly on a purchase offer. So if a buyer, uh, if a seller, excuse me, sees a cash offer, they automatically are going to assume that that cash offer is going to close faster than a mortgage. Um, and again, people coming from out of state, this may be something that is more specific to New York State in our process here in the Hudson Valley. But typically, a cash transaction is probably closing around 30 days, and a mortgage transaction is, is likely closing somewhere more in a 45 to 60 day time frame. So a seller may feel that a cash offer, even if it's less than what they're being offered with a mortgage, is better because um, the time frame will likely be faster. Uh, especially when you do start to get into the type of financing. So a conventional loan, I would roughly state that the total transaction time frame from the time of signing the contract would be about 45 to 60 days. If you are obtaining a VA loan, an FHA loan, a USDA loan, or some other type of government insured loan program, there's actually a double approval process which can delay that transaction. Now, of course, this is specific to the the lender that you choose. Every lender kind of has a different time frame. However, I do usually caution buyers that if they are choosing a government insured loan, the time frame will likely be a bit longer than our conventional time frame. And our estimated closing date, like I said a moment ago, that is going to be set forth in the purchase offer because that is important for not only you as the buyer, but also as the seller to see what is the time frame that they're looking at. Are they looking at a normal closing time frame? Are they looking to you know, get a conventional loan and close somewhere in 45 to 60 days? Or is there something else going on here? Um, maybe you're in a situation where you really don't wanna close um, for maybe 90 days because you're waiting for uh, a child to finish school or something like that. Um, that also could be the flip side of it, where maybe the seller is looking for an extended closing time frame because they would like their child to finish school. If you as a buyer are flexible and the seller needs the additional time, then that's a great thing to put on a purchase offer to help the seller feel comfortable with the transaction because they know that they have that extra time. As a buyer, if you need more time than the normal um, closing uh, estimation, then it's important to put that here because you don't really want to blindside the seller down the road that really you actually need longer to close. And we'll talk a little bit more about our closing dates as we get further into this presentation. So next, after a purchase offer um, occurs, the next thing that happens typically in New York is that once the offer is accepted, a buyer will proceed with a home inspection of the property a due diligence inspection, which can take the form of various different items. Most commonly will be a general home inspection. There may also be a radon test as part of that to see if the radon levels in the property are elevated uh, to a level of concern. Uh, also might be if the property is serviced by well and septic, would be maybe a test of the well water to make sure there's no bacteria. Could also be, again, a detailed septic inspection um, to make sure that the septic tank on the property is functioning and in good condition. So um, those inspections, again, typically take place after the offer has been accepted, but before a contract has been signed. 
Um, so those contingencies that you have set forth in your purchase offer will, will take place usually um, in the period of time between that accepted offer and contract. However, there are other contingencies that are going to remain. Um, most commonly is going to be the mortgage contingency. Um, the mortgage contingency, if you made it in your offer, is going to carry right over into the contract. Are you if you're getting a conventional, an FHA, VA, USDA, whatever your loan type that you're getting, um, you're going to have a time frame in which to be formally approved for that loan. What that means is a mortgage commitment. The lender in a pre-approval usually reviews very basic information. Um, once they've reviewed that, uh, they usually issue you just a very generic pre-approval letter. Once you go into contract, you submit usually a formal loan application. That's when they do a, a digger dive, a deeper dive into um, what, what they need to look at to make sure that you are qualified to get this loan. So you usually have a contingency in the main contract of sale, typically in the range of about 30 to 45 days to get a formal approval of your loan. It typically doesn't mean that once your loan is approved that you are required to close right away. It's typically set forth that you have, again, about 30 to 45 days to get that approval and then about 45 to 60 days to close because typically the approval um, does set forth conditions that have to be satisfied by you as the buyer before you're actually able to schedule your closing. Most commonly, those conditions may look like updated pay stubs, um, updated bank account statements uh, showing the correct cash to close figures, uh, updated verification of, of employment, um, things like that where the lender does need to confirm all of those items before they say you're ready to close. So very commonly that, uh, that mortgage contingency of course is going to carry over into a contract of sale. Additionally, an appraisal contingency, if you are um, you know, taking advantage of that, will certainly be put in a contract of sale as well. If you're setting forth a semi uh, waiver there where you're gonna set forth a floor, it has to appraise for X dollar amount and I'll still proceed at the purchase price, then that should again be clear in the purchase offer because that will also carry through in the contract as well. Um, and any additional contingencies. So in some situations, we may have a contract come through um, where there might be an underground fuel tank, or there could be questions that there may be an underground fuel tank, but it's not confirmed. Um, you also may have a situation where you've done your general home inspection, everything seems okay, but your home inspector is suggesting that you do um, a, a septic test. And you know maybe the septic inspector is booked out for a period of time, another week or two, and you wanna get moving on the contract and the seller is okay with that. Um, you would wanna just make sure that those contingencies are clear because they need to be carried over into the contract. So your realtor will assist with this, but it's also something as a first time home buyer, you'd really wanna make sure you spoke with your attorney about and that those contingencies are provided for in the contract that you're signing. Um, the next part of a contract uh, that can often take buyers by surprise is the closing date. So an honor about closing date uh, is a rough 30 day window. So 30 days, let's say I've set forth May 15th on or about as my closing date in the contract. That means that we have to close by June 15th. So there's a 30-day window added onto that. So there's no default on your end as a buyer for failing to close by May 15th, so long as you close by June 15th. The important thing on an honor about closing, which is our, our most common uh, closing language, is that that time frame does apply to the seller as well. So if you're on a time crunch and you really need to close by a certain date, then you may want to talk to your attorney about changing this language. And there are various other um, wordings that can be put in. And that would be, a, again, a case-by-case -case specific situation. But typically that 30-day window will apply in which both parties have access to. There are some situations where you will see a time of essence closing date. That is a hard date. That means if you don't close by that date, your down payment may be um, lost to the seller at that point. You will see that when the property is bank owned. 
So if you're purchasing a property like Fannie Mae, for example, that's a bank owned property, um, you're gonna have a time of essence closing date of let's say May 15th. If you fail to comply and close by May 15th, regardless of the reason, unless the delay is caused by the seller, um, then in that situation, you could end up forfeiting your down payment. Um, in the closing date timeframe, you should really consider those rate lock um, extensions and, and expiration dates. Um, locking your rate is a really hot topic right now. I could probably do an entire webinar just on considering when to lock your rate. This is, of course, again, going to be something that's case by case where you may decide something is really important to you because the rate is low at this moment. You want to lock it in. And if you have to pay an extension fee, you will. Um, there are other buyers that just don't feel comfortable incurring additional closing costs and might want to see what happens as the rate fluctuates throughout their transaction. Rate locks vary by lender. So you may have a lender that does only 30-day rate locks or 60-day rate locks. You may have a lender that provides you with various options. You can lock for 15, 30, 45, 60 days, 90 days, um, but they cost different amounts of money. These are things that you definitely want to make sure you are speaking about with your lender, but also with your attorney, because there are various things that can delay our closing date, like title issues. Uh, and if you were in a situation where the closing was delayed, you may incur additional fees for extending your rate in which you, um, as the buyer, uh, would incur, not the seller. So it is definitely an important topic there. Um, the property condition disclosure credit, going back to an inspection. So this is uh, in New York State, something that's very unique. Um, we offer sellers an option. They can either complete a series of disclosures on their property that do survive closing, which means that if you find out one of those disclosures was untrue, that seller could face potential legal liability. Um, the other side of that would be making the sale as is. And in order to do that under New York State law, in most cases, you have to provide your buyer with a $500 credit. The way I look at that is the $500 is effectively the cost of a home inspection, give or take a little bit. So um, the $500 is the insurance for the seller that the closing is final, nothing uh, can come back to them, but it's also peace of mind for a buyer. You have had a qualified and professional company come in and give you a report based on the condition of the property. You're not actually relying upon things that the seller has told you. Um, so this is something that also will be provided in the contract that you would discuss with your attorney. Um, moving on into the transaction after contract or sign, the next thing that happens is that we order a title search. We do make sure there's good title to the property. We also make sure there are no building code violations. So title very commonly um, is going to disclose easements on the property, which are rights of others to use your property. And most commonly, those easements are considered utility easements. So uh, the local utility company may have the right to use the front 10 to 15 feet of your property to lay um, or bury lines or poles or transformers to bring electricity and power, you know, and uh, natural gas, what could also be water and sewer to the properties that benefit from that. Very, very common. Um, however, there could also be easements for other things that, again, your attorney would review with you and, and talk about in detail. There could also be deed restrictions, which um, are very common in subdivisions where you see a neighborhood where they want to keep the properties looking similar. They may say you can't do certain things, like you can't put an above ground pool up. Maybe you can't have um, a certain type of colored siding on your, your house or a certain roof. Um, it may dictate uh, that you have to use a certain type of landscaping. Um, if, you if you're buying in like a condo, a townhouse, some type of HOA community, then you're gonna see these restrictions definitely. Um, but in, uh, you know, in a regular subdivision, you may also see some looser deed restrictions, which might say you have to use the property for residential purposes. You can't have a business there. Um, things like that. So that would all be contained in the title report. 
A survey is gonna actually be a map of the property where it gets drawn out. This isn't usually a requirement for closing in New York. So um, a lot of buyers do choose to waive the survey because it is an additional cost, but it is an important piece if you uh, do feel that you have the money to be able to spend on the survey, I would absolutely suggest getting it because it's gonna show the boundary lines of the property. It's gonna show the improvements on the property. And it's also gonna show the location of those easements if there are any um, where they are. So that way, you know, you can't um, put something in, in the way of that easement. It will also show any encroachments onto or off of the property. So very commonly you get a shed, um, you know, that, that might actually be on the neighbor's property, but really belongs to your property or vice versa. Um, so things like that, fences, uh, pools, you know, some type of encroachment onto the neighboring property, or again, from the neighboring property onto yours, which would only be disclosed by the survey. The municipal search or other uh, way to look at it would be a building department search. Just check to make sure there are no code violations on the property. So that's a super important part of this transaction as well, especially as a buyer. Um, you want to really make sure that you're buying this property without any open code violations. Unfortunately, this search in a lot of municipalities can take anywhere from three to six weeks to come in. It's a, it, it is a longer search. Um, however, it is really important to closing. Um, another part of the process, of course, would be the appraisal. Um, what is the bank valuing the property at, which again, typically takes place during the contract timeframe. You also receive your mortgage approval at some point in that timeframe as well. And then after all of the conditions are met, the title search is in and is good. The appraisal is done. The building department search or the municipal search is in, showing no violations. That's when your lender will clear your file for closing. And that's when you can actually schedule an official closing date. So the contract closing date is a target time frame that we try to be close to. However, it will fluctuate as you can see all of these things need to be accomplished before we can actually pick a date that is mutually agreeable between the parties. So that leads us to the end. What happens is that you close on the property, you become the owner at, of this property at the time of the closing. So on the closing day, typically you'll do a final walkthrough as I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, that final walkthrough is to make sure the property isn't substantially the same condition that you saw it in during your home inspection, only subject to really minor changes, like maybe small holes in the walls from a picture being taken down. Um, that will again usually occur the morning of the closing right before uh, you actually pay for the property. Um, also will be the final closing figures and, and if you are financing a closing disclosure from your lender setting forth all the final terms under your loan, your cash to close and final closing costs. And the closing uh, is final. So that is something, again, specific maybe to the state of New York here, that once you close on the property, our contract ends. So there usually aren't, aren't any conditions that will survive that, that final closing date. Um, after closing, if anything happens, then, then the risk kind of falls on you as the buyer. So that's why it's important up until this date to really make sure that you are comfortable with, with what you are doing because closing uh, is kind of the end all be all um, and the seller won't have liability uh, for the most part after closing. And so this is a home buyer's guide that uh, our firm has developed. Um, this is something that talks about, you know, uh, some questions that home buyers may have, whether you're a first time home buyer or somebody who's done this a few times. It's definitely something that is, uh, you know, is beneficial to look through. It talks about uh, down payments, talks about um, various different considerations uh, that, you know, a home buyer may, may uh, look at before they enter into a purchase offer or even in the beginning stages before you're even ready to start looking at properties. Um, of course, if you have any questions, you can also feel free um, to post them here. There is a, a question and answer and also a chat, which I'm able to see. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, at this point. Um, otherwise, uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us for this brief presentation on some considerations for being a home buyer. Um, and I look forward you know, to answering questions and helping, uh, helping you in the future. 
Um, one thing that I will point out, it's not quite uh, something that you might consider when you're putting an offer on a house, but once you become a homeowner, especially if you're a first time homeowner, um, if you don't have your estate planning in place, that's something that I would absolutely want you to be uh, considering at the time of closing, because now you have, you are owning a piece of real property um, and you want to make sure that your estate planning is prepared to deal with that. Um, so my colleague and partner, Michael Wagner on March 30th, just a couple of days away, at 5.30, we'll be doing a wonderful webinar and some considerations for estate planning. I'm sure he you know, can answer uh, any questions that you may have, especially as they may uh, pertain to being a first-time home buyer um, or even an existing homeowner with multiple properties and how those should be dealt with in your estate. Um, otherwise, again, I'll stick around for a little bit. I will continue to answer questions. You can also feel free to reach out directly to me, either by phone or by email. This is my contact information. I'm happy to um, talk to you, even if you are in the very early stages. I get a lot of buyers who call up even before they've looked at a house. They just want to understand certain things. So happy to go through it with you at that point, um, because I feel that the better uh, you feel and the more educated you feel going in, the uh, the cleaner the transaction is going to be as you as you move forward. So um, at this time, I will uh, I will end our presentation. I'll stick around for a little bit to answer questions. Otherwise, please feel free to um, you know to reach out in the future. Thank you so much.